right, let's get started. We will have a word of prayer and uh, share some scripture and we will get going here as we uh, continue the study on Revelation. Uh, we're going to be looking at Revelation 4, 5, and 6 tonight, uh, kind of moving forward, uh, going from the, the, the uh, John's um, picture of the past and of his present and now we're moving into the future, which is our future as well. Uh, so let's go before the Lord in prayer as we start tonight. Father, we, uh, we come to you tonight thanking you for times uh, just such as these, times where we can uh, dig into your word, where we can go beyond just the milk of your word and get into the meat of your word. Father, we want to do that, but we can't do it, Lord God, without the help of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, begin to reveal to us now those truths that you've set uh, within these pages uh, so that we might gain understanding and wisdom and knowledge, Father. Not that we would be puffed up, but that we would be informed, so that we would be ready uh, for what lies ahead, that we would be watchmen uh, standing on the wall uh, and sounding the alarm uh, for uh, the things that uh, are going to happen. So we thank you for that tonight. Lord, direct us in your word in every way. Uh, we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Somebody turn uh, for me tonight to Mark chapter 13. We just got done reading that uh, in our daily reading schedule. Mark 13 and someone read for me verses 32 through 37. That's kind of our theme for tonight. That's really why we're here. Last week we encouraged you to be Bereans, <clears throat> which means uh, search the word for yourself. Uh, go into the things that you hear. Uh, and that you're taught, and make sure yourself, as you read the scriptures, make sure uh, that those things that you've been taught are true. That's being a Berean. Tonight, we want to encourage you to be watchmen. Connie, have you got that? Read that for us. We just need to be awake. We need to be watchful. Uh, and God, uh, just like we said this morning in the service, God will take care of the rest uh, as we go forward. We won't be caught by surprise uh, because we're aware of these things. That's why we're spending time here tonight. Uh, so. Watch, exactly. That does not mean sleeping. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, tonight, one of the things that we gave to you tonight, and I know probably I stirred up some confusion last week when we uh, kind of finished talking about this idea of paradise uh, and where folks went uh, in the Old Testament when they died. Um, and, and what is this place uh, that's described as being below or in the center of the earth? How does it relate to us? So rather than spend a lot of time on that, uh, I gave you this first sheet. I uh, hope you've had the chance to at least skim over it a little bit. We can still uh, talk about it and, and entertain some questions tonight if you would like to. What I want you all to know as Christians tonight when you die, when any Christian dies, what happens? Okay, where's your body go? In the grave, in the ground, okay? Dust to dust. Um, it's not going to stay there. That's the good thing to know. But when we die as Christians, the Bible says, and this is at the bottom of your sheet, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So as Christians, as children of God, we go directly to heaven. There's no hell or Hades or paradise down below that we're concerned with. 
as children of God, as the bride belonging to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, we go to be with him. Uh, and that's the important thing to know. Now, uh, is there a place for other righteous souls? Now, by saying that, refer to the other righteous souls as folks like believing Jews that may not understand Jesus as their Messiah or others that have never heard the name of Jesus but still believe. Uh, is there a place for them? Well, we're not told anywhere in the scriptures that paradise below has been done away with. It will be if you read the last chapters of Revelation. You'll find that when it comes to the white throne judgment, that hell and Hades, Hades is that place where paradise is or was, hell and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. That's the destruction of the place below because it will be, uh, hell will be replaced with a lake of fire, the second death. So this sheet hopefully will answer some of your questions. If you have additional questions, write them down, bring them in here, uh, and we'll talk about them. So um, hopefully this will clarify a few things so that you, I don't want to confuse you, but this is the theology of what's called Sheol, which is the Jewish name for that place that the New Testament calls Hades. All right? Tonight, we're going to be looking at Revelation 4 and 6. We're not going to do it quite like we did last week. Last week, we read all three chapters and then tried to think about different aspects of those three chapters. Uh, I think God was gracious to us, and I, th I think we answered some questions. Tonight, let's take it a chapter at a time. We'll read a chapter, and then we'll talk about that chapter. Then, when things quiet down a little bit, we'll read the next chapter, and we'll talk about that chapter. And so we'll try to cover the three chapters tonight, beginning with chapter four. So let's begin right now. Some of the diagrams that I've given to you uh, cover chapters four, five, and six, and we'll be talking about those in just a minute. There are some things that I found to be very interesting about these three chapters, some things that I didn't know about as I've been studying and preparing. Uh, so I think that it'll be very informative, uh, some things that uh, we can kind of put in the margin uh, of our Bible to remind us. So let's begin chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. We'll read through the chapter. We'll talk about a few things. We'll give you an opportunity. As we're reading down through, don't be afraid to mark your Bible ever, ever. You know, it, it's okay to mark your Bible. So put a, a star next to a verse that you want to focus on or underline something that you don't understand or that you want to uh, bring something uh, about, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that way, okay? Let's begin. Let's see. What side looks like they want to read tonight? Let's go over. I knew Vic was going to raise his hand. Let's start over here with Vic. We'll go around this table. Then we'll go over to Barb. We'll go around that table. We'll jump over here to Deb, and we'll go around that table. We'll read uh, read as many verses as you like. If you don't feel like reading or you forgot your glasses, pass it on to the next person. And we'll read through, first of all, chapter 4. Nice and slow, nice and loud. Don't worry if you don't have the exact same wording. There's, I'm sure in this room there's different translations. That's okay. Just read what you have in your Bible and understand that the meaning is all the same. It all comes from the same original language. Okay? Vic, would you start us off in chapter 4? After this I looked, and lo, heaven a door open, and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me, was like a trumpet, and said, Come up hither, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and circled with thrones, and on these thrones were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And out of his throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne Four beasts, full of eyes, before him. 
seven. Okay. Questions? Right. Uh, I guess I'm going to try to find it here, but uh, the 24 elders fall down before him and they sit on his hand and worship him. Is that still going on? Yeah. Is that a continual thing that's constantly coming off of their throne and then going down into worship? Well, we, we don't know. Uh, in John's vision, uh, this seemed to be we know that for the four living creatures, it was continuous. As far as the 24 elders, uh, we don't know whether that's repeated from time to time, whether it's a continuous thing, but certainly one of the things in heaven that we will experience, unlike we experience it today, because it will be so much better and, and so much more intense, is worship. And we will find in a regular way that worship is going, to be an, is going to be an important part of our heavenly experience. Why is that? Because we will be standing in front of Almighty God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. God in his fullest character will be there and we will see him face to face we will experience that place in its fullest and you you will not be able to help but worship and fall down before his presence That's right. That's right. We, yeah, you, you won't be able to help yourself. It's exactly, I, I like that comparison to a, an exciting sporting event or something like that or going to see a, a wonderful concert that sends chills up and down your back and you just, or tears to your eyes. You just, you react that way because that's how God has put us together. Part of who we are, and now especially as Christians, as the people of God, Part of who we are is people of praise, of, of worship. God made us to be that way. And I'll guarantee you, every one of us, when we stand before his presence with thousands upon thousands of angels, and these four living creatures bring praise to him, constantly saying, holy, holy, holy uh, is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is, and who is to come. Um, we will join in that Saw. It's just like the worship team leading us on a Sunday morning, except now it's all the heavenly hosts and all of the saints will be there, and we will be standing literally before his presence. And you know, I, I'm not even sure we'll be able to stand. It may bring us to our knees in praise, and, and we will sing together with the heavenly realms before his presence. He's deserving of all praise. And we won't be able to help ourselves just because it will be so amazingly glorious. It, it will be spontaneous. Vic? Because everything is different in heaven, we don't have anything to compare it to. Th 
this will not be boring, ladies and gentlemen. No. We will not faint. We will not dread this for eternity. We will look forward to it. We Never will be able tired. to do just what he says to do. It's a whole different way to look at things than we have down here. Yeah. It's not that the worship team is going to sing six o'clock or five. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll know all the words, by the way. That's right. Yeah. No, but you're not going to have them up on a screen or have a hymnal. You will know. Why? Because we know in full. I saw that the spontaneity of how we just sing the name. Yeah. Like, oh, this is how exciting Yeah. So in answer to your question, Ron, it wouldn't surprise me if the 24 elders on a very regular basis as as praise and worship begins to well up once again in that place, and it's, it's going to happen, it wouldn't surprise me if they repeat what we've just read on a regular basis. Uh, one of the privileges you and I will have in glory is to be able to cast our crowns. Um, the, 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 the rewards that we have received for what we have done here the crowns that God has given us, we'll be able to take them off and cast them at his feet in worship. Uh, I mean, that's what a, what a wonderful privilege. Let's look at, you know, one of the things we understand from the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, is the fact that Jesus is there. We can see him represented in so many different ways through every book. You know, in Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. And it goes on and on and on through every one of the books. Jesus is really the theme of this book. So as we read chapter 4, let me point out a few things here that point to Christ for us. Um, one of the things that we are, uh, are noticing here, first of all, it says, uh, and there before me was a door standing open. Let's not pass over that too quickly. Because John chapter 10, somebody turn for me to John chapter 10 and read that section. I think it's verses 7, 8, and 9, if you've got that. Uh, this door standing open. Hmm? John chapter 10, uh, I think it's 7, 8, and 9 are, is the verses that we're looking for. Okay, so this door, by the way, the other translation for that portion of Scripture in John, gate is door. Jesus said, I am the door. I'm the gate. I am the way, the truth, the life. He is the open door that John is recognizing here. So right away in chapter 4, we're already thinking about the Lord. We're already thinking about Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, he's the door standing open in heaven. And then uh, we, uh, that this voice that sounds like a trumpet is saying, come up here. I like that. What does that remind you? Something, a voice that sounds like a trumpet saying, come up here to John. The rapture. The rapture, yeah. Yeah, we know one of the things, one of the ways you can identify the rapture. Remember, there's two parts, if you will, of the second coming. There's the rapture part where we are taken up to meet the Lord in the air and to go with him to glory. And what signifies that or what you want to look for in scripture when that's described is a trumpet blast. There's no trumpet blast described for us for the literal second coming or when Christ comes back at Armageddon to set his foot on earth. That's the second part the second coming. When he comes back uh, at the time of Armageddon, we come back with him, which means we already have to be there. So we're raptured before that point in time. So when we read this verse here, there's this voice that John hears that sounds to him like a trumpet, and there's a voice that speaks to him and says, come up here. You know, that's all God is going to have to say to us. 
whether you're in the grave as a Christian or whether you're in a, in a room as a Christian still alive, you'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. If you're in the grave, you're going to be raised up first and we'll meet together with those who are, are asleep in Christ to be with him in the air. And there's going to be a trumpet blast to announce that. And God is going to say, come up here and we will obey that command. Uh, just as John did. And he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So now, verse 1 uh, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, uh, we're, we're already looking forward. I'm gonna, God is going to show John what must come or take place after this. After, after, what? After, after what he's just described. Remember, he's talked to the seven churches. Okay, he's talked about the seven churches. Jesus has, has spoken to the seven churches that were in existence in John, John's day. And you know the number seven represents completeness. So when we talk about seven churches, we're talking about the whole church. That's John's day, his contemporaries. But now this voice speaks to him and says to John, come up here. He's going to the, to the throne room of God, to the very throne of God. God says, come up here. I'm going to show you what must take place after this, after your contemporary day, after the day you live in. In other words, in the future. And so we begin looking toward the future. Uh, John says, at once I was in the spirit. <clears throat> we don't really fully understand what that means, but there's enough instances in the Bible where folks were, were carried away in the, in the spirit. I think of Philip uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch uh, on the road. Uh, he read uh, with him from the book of Isaiah. He baptized that eunuch, and it says immediately he was found in another place. He was, he was transported, if you will. And so there's, there's this, um, this power of God demonstrated in John's life uh, where at once he was in the spirit. And by the way, heaven is a, a, a spiritual place. You've got to have a spiritual connection. If you're not born again, if you don't have a living human spirit, you have no connection to heaven. That's the importance of being born again. You've got to have that third part of the human uh, being uh, to be connected to God. We lost that in the garden but it's been reestablished now through Christ when we're born again. Being born again means to be made alive in the spirit once again. Okay, It's not entering into your mother's womb a second time and being born naturally. It's born of spirit to spirit. Yep. That's right. Exactly. That's, that's the power that is... Remember, John is a child of God. He's a Christian. When this is happening, he knows God. He's born again. And so the Holy Spirit is, is instrumental in the power of God being demonstrated here. The Holy Spirit takes him in this experience. It takes him to the very throne room of God. Now, I can't tell you whether it's a dream, whether it's a vision, whether it's reality. We don't understand this. This is a supernatural thing. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Capital S. You're exactly right, Diane. Thank you for that. And all of a sudden, he says, immediately I was in the spirit, and boom, all of a sudden, he says, and there before me was the throne in heaven. So he's there. Instantaneously, he's there. And he's standing before the throne of God. And he said, somebody is sitting on that throne. Now, when we see Jesus and God in that place, what do you think we're going to see? Light. Light. Light, good. Yeah, remember the Mount of Transfiguration? We just read about that in the two Gospels, Matthew and Mark. You're going to read it again in Luke. Remember uh, how Jesus appears? on the Mount of Transfiguration, so bright. He's like as bright as the sun, pure white and shining, almost blinding, but it's not like looking at the sun where it hurts you, where you can damage your eyes. You can look at Jesus all day long, 
and it, all it does is fill your heart with, with love and the fullness of God's presence. So I would imagine when we're there and, and we see the throne, you're going to know that someone is sitting on it, but you're not going to, have, to be able to make them out that well. It's just going to be this brilliant light that has a presence uh, and a love that we've never experienced before. So John sees this. And then we get a brief description for him from him in terms of color. And this is really cool. He says, And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 28. Let's not just gloss over what we just read. Exodus 28. <clears throat> beginning with verse 15. Fashion a breastplate. Everybody there? Exodus 28, beginning with verse 15. This is the, we're talking about the priestly garments. The garments of the high priest. And God says, fashion a breastplate for making decisions the work of a skilled craftsman, make it like the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet yarn in a finely twisted linen. It is to be square, a span long and a span wide, and folded double. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it. In the first row there shall be a ruby, a topaz, and a beryl. In the second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and an emerald. In the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. In the fourth row, a chrysolite, an onyx, and a jasper. Mount them in gold filigree settings. There are to be twelve stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel. Okay, so are you getting the picture? each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. Okay, so one of the most important priestly garment or, or items of the priestly, uh, the high priest garments was this breastplate. And on it were 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And each stone is different and each stone was to be engraved with the name of of that particular son of Jacob, of Israel. Now let's go back to what we just read in Revelation. Revelation says that when John saw this one on the throne, he saw something that had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Jasper, let me, let me reverse it, carnelian and jasper were the first stone and the last stone on the breastplate. Carnelian is another name for ruby. Jasper is a crystal clear precious stone, almost like a diamond. So we see in John's first glimpse of the throne of God, he said, there's someone sitting there. Not quite sure who it is, but they have the appearance of ruby and jasper. The first and the last stone on the breastplate. Now, if you're not getting it, if that phrase first and last doesn't connect, let's go a little bit further because John's not done describing that person. 
Verse 3, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircle the throne. Folks, if you go back to that breastplate and you figure it out, remember each stone was ascribed to each of the 12 sons. Guess who the emerald designates? Judah. Judah is represented by the emerald. So you have the first and the last stone, and you have the stone of Judah. If that's not Jesus, I don't know who is. He's there. He is both sitting on the stone, and we will soon see him as a lamb in John's description. Now, let me just take an aside, because we last week we didn't get a chance to mention this to you. This idea of the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, is important. Jesus is always describing himself. He says, I am the alpha and the omega. We read that, I think, in chapter 1. We read where he says, I'm the beginning and the end, the first and the last. If we're talking about in eternity, there is no beginning and end. So when we talk about the Alpha and the Omega, we're talking about the creation of God. Jesus was there in the beginning. He was the beginning. It says that nothing was created apart from what he created. And he is also going to be there at the end as the Savior of the world and the Son of God. Now, when you read that, there's a couple things that we want to make mention of because I didn't realize this and when I read it, I, my mouth kind of fell open and I said, wow, I didn't know that. In the Bible, there are things hidden in the Greek and Hebrew text that unless you go to a concordance, you don't, you, you don't see. You just don't see it. And the things that are hidden are in regards to this first and last title. When Jesus said in chapter 1 and verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, that's in the Greek. Okay, we're reading the Greek New Testament. So it's written in the Greek. But in the text, the Alpha in that sentence, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Alpha in that sentence is spelled out in Revelation 1.8. But... The omega, which is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha is the first letter, omega is the last letter. The omega is the singular letter, omega. Alpha is spelled out, omega is just the singular last letter in the Greek alphabet. Why is that? What's the significance of that? Okay, why would, why would God... Put that in his word like that, spelling out the alpha in Greek, but writing just the omega symbol for the last letter. It's, it's a linguistic picture for you and I. And in looking at that, it indicates to us that the beginning alpha is completed. It's the full word. But the ending is still yet to be. It's not complete. And that, isn't that amazing how God points out these, these little truths to us in such a special way? Now, even more interesting... Okay. Hmm? Uh, actually, faith, it's... In, in, uh, Revelation 1.8 is the verse that we're referring to, okay? And it says in that, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. You see that? Uh, all of the translations indicate that in one way or another. Does anybody have a different translation than Alpha and Omega? A to Z. A to Z, good. We would understand that in our English. That's the first letter and the last letter. But the Alpha and Omega are the, the, the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I get that, but I don't get what you're saying. Why you the, 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 the 
Okay, when I'm talking about the, the spelling out of alpha and just the singular letter for omega, that is from the original Greek language. If you go in, if you have a concordance at home, do a little searching in there, and you'll find out that that's the way it's presented in, in verse 8 of chapter 1. It's not alpha spelled out, omega spelled out. Yours, yours is in the English. We're talking about the Greek. See, somebody's done us the favor of writing the word omega. That's not the way it, it, the way it ought to appear in the original Greek is just the single letter. It would be like us writing down a Z rather than a, a Z-E-E. -E. Okay? So we find out that, that this picture that's painted for us is the, the, the beginning is complete, but the end is not finished yet. Now, the, the Hebrew is even more fascinating. There's more interesting things that arise in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew alphabet, the first and last letters are the Aleph, A-H-L-E-F. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the last letter is the Tav, T-A-H-V, Tav. The Aleph and the Tav in the Hebrew. Okay, Aleph is A-H-L-E-F. That's the Hebrew A, if you will. And the Z in the Hebrew alphabet is Tav, T-A-H-V. So the Aleph and the Tav. Genesis 1-1. You all know that. In the beginning, it goes something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But as it's written in the Hebrew, if you go back to the original language, again, use your concordance, in the original language, there are two untranslated letters between God and the word created. Those two letters are the Aleph and the Tav. If you read the original Hebrew, it goes something like this. In the beginning, God, the Aleph and Tav, created. That reminds us that there was someone else involved in this creation, and it was the Son of God. It was Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's there. And the Aleph and the Tav are in the very first verse of our Bible in Genesis 1.1, right between God and created. Now, it doesn't stop there. That happens again in Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah 12.10 says this, They will look on me whom they have pierced. You've read that prophecy. All the way back in Zechariah, pointing to Jesus Christ. And the way that really reads is much like in the Genesis verse, they will look on me, the Aleph, the Tav, there. They're not in our translations, but they're there. They will look on me, the Aleph and the Tav, whom they have pierced. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. So we see how that name or that description of Christ is important. Without him, nothing would have been created. And without him, Nothing will be completed in the end. So the Alpha and the Omega are tremendously important. We see him again in the, in the ruby and in the jasper from the breastplate, as described here by John. Uh, and uh, his presence is represented throughout, uh, throughout the scripture in that way. Surrounding the throne, any questions about that? Is that clear? Is that clear? Ron? What, what would the... What, what, what did the Jews... How did they interpret that? They, they, they have a hard time with that because they don't get it. That's the look of the Messiah. That's right. I mean, the Messiah could have been a man born of Joseph. It probably could have been. We don't believe that. Yeah, especially because we killed him. 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Doesn't they even read the New Testament? Nope. No. Well, I mean, some of them. Yep. I'm sure some do. And there are many Messianic Jews, completed Jews, Christian Jews, that have discovered these things that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you were a Jew and you're reading that very first verse of your Bible, the Old Testament, and you read in the beginning, God, the Aleph and the Tav created the heavens and earth, you're, you're going, what? God, the A, the A to Z? They don't believe it. They don't. They don't because they don't believe, they don't understand. Who, who's that talking about? They don't have revelation, folks. They don't have Jesus saying to them, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So they're not getting it. Just they struggle with their scripture, their own scripture, because I think we mentioned last week, or we've talked about it in a Bible study, one of the, the most common words in the Old Testament used for God is Elohim. That's plural. That's a plural word. And so when they read that word, they're saying, why isn't that singular? Why isn't that Eloi? Okay, exactly. So not necessarily plural, but every. Yeah. Our mission to us is yeah. to make presence. Yeah. And so that's the way they justify that and say, you know, but then you go to like John 1 1, where in the beginning was with him and the word was made flesh. Yep. It was with him and the word was him. And then go down, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and the word was God. That's where we know that God dwelt in the form of flesh, dwelt among us, and we know. Yep. It shouldn't be any surprise because when Jesus walked among his brethren, the Jews, and said, this is who I am. I'm, I'm here. I'm Messiah. They still didn't. I mean, in, in the very presence of their own Messiah, they still didn't accept it. In fact, they didn't accept it so much that they hung him on a cross and killed him. But that was part of God's plan and purpose so that we might have forgiveness of sin so that we might have a lamb that died on our behalf um, who are the 24 elders this is an interesting question it's been discussed a lot hmm? well some say okay these are probably angels <laughs> all right good the most popular we, we don't know it doesn't tell us who they are. We know they're elders, so they have some position, if you will. And their, their 12 thrones suggest that they have position. The 12, the, the 24 thrones around the throne of God. Uh, and they're given this great privilege of worshiping God and casting their crowns down before him. Uh, one of the verses, I think it's Matthew 19, 28. Let me, uh, let me take you back there for just a second that suggests who this might be. Jesus is talking to his apostles. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you, verse 27 of chapter 19. We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us, Peter says. And Jesus answered, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things... When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, you can interpret that as being during the millennium, and it may very well be. I believe the apostles are going to have an important place during the millennial reign of Christ when he sits on his earthly throne. But I think this could also suggest to us Jesus' throne in heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Essentially, they're on the same throne, but he sits at the right hand of the Father. He's one with the heavenly Father. So when we're looking in Revelation and John's describing the throne, 
It, it's both Jesus that he's seeing as well as God the Father and the Holy Spirit as well because we read about that sevenfold spirit that's there uh, represented also. So there's the idea that there's 24 elders. My opinion, if you want it, is that 12 of those represent the 12 patriarchs uh, of Israel, the sons of Israel, and the other 12 represent the 12 apostles of the New Testament. That seems, um, seems to fit very well. Uh, I don't think these are angels. Angels, uh, it says they cast their crowns before the throne of God. Angels aren't given crowns. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a good translation or a good, good interpretation. Uh, the best we know right now is that they represent the 12 patriarchs, or patriarchs of the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the New Testament. If... Don't forget, we're not really separate from Israel. We're, we're part of Israel, folks. You're, you're a Jew tonight, whether you realize it or not. We've been adopted. We've been grafted in to that Jewish tree. Uh, and the promises of God that were given through Abraham for Israel, we are part of that nation. Uh, and we're not separate from that nation. Uh, so we need to understand that. And, and so the 24 elders, there doesn't seem to be, it doesn't say the 12 elders over here and the 12 <laughs> elders over there. It's 24 elders that represent the whole uh, of, of, God's, of, of God's kingdom. Um, so I, I'm, my opinion, my interpretation of that is the 12 uh, patriarchs from the Old Testament and the 12 apostles. Um, it says they were dressed in white. That speaks of righteousness, uh, the crowns of gold on their heads. And uh, before the throne, the seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. So the Holy Spirit is represented there as well. We talked about that last week. Uh, and um, it says before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. One of the things when we're looking at the throne in God, the, the temple of God in heaven, which is what we're doing here. We need to remember if we don't understand something about that temple and that throne and that place in heaven, one of the things we can look at is the earthly temple, the earth, earthly tabernacle and how that was set up. Remember, uh, Hebrews tells us that the earthly, the, the, the temple and the tabernacle here on earth God gave the design for the way he did because they are representative of or shadows of the reality of the temple and the throne of God in heaven. So if we don't understand something about that place in heaven, we can look at the earthly and see if we can't find something that represents what we're reading about in heaven. This sea of glass uh, reminds us of uh, something in the Old Testament temple uh, uh, worship. Do you remember anything there that had water in it? What? It was what was called the sea. It was a place for washing, for cleansing, for the sacrifice. And so there is also a place in heaven that's called this, this sea of, of glass, clear as crystal, that once again reminds us of the washing of our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our sacrifice. On earth, the sacrifices were washed in that wash basin, if you will, by the temple. But the, 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 the sea of glass, clear as crystal in heaven, reminds us of the washing uh, in the blood of Jesus Christ that our sins might be forgiven. So everything we see in heaven is symbolized or foreshadowed in what we see here on earth. So keep that in mind because there will be other situations that we'll be looking at. And then it talks about these four living creatures. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's four living creatures. Ezekiel talked a lot about them. They're kind of a strange character in, uh, in Revelation and back in Ezekiel. These four living creatures are the four angels or cherubim 
another name for the, their special angels. They're powerful angels, angels, and they are assigned to the throne of God. Wherever the throne of God is or wherever God's presence is, you will find these four living. And if your translation says beasts, that's a bad translation. The word is zoon, Z-O-O-N. It means creatures, the four living creatures, not beasts. We read about the, the beast uh, later on in Revelation. That's a different word. That's not zoon. So the four living creatures that, that uh, are described for us uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and again in chapter 10 uh, are the cherubim. Ezekiel 10 describes them and gives them a name. So we understand these are, these are angels. One of the unique features about these angels is they have four faces. Four faces are this. A man's face, a lion's face, an ox's face, an oxen face, and Ezekiel 10, that changes from ox to cherub. And that could be important. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So there's a man, there's a lion, there's an ox, and there's an eagle. Four. Four faces. Now you might be saying, well, how, how come in Revelation, when John sees them, it says each of them uh, had a different face? He said one had the face of a man, one had the face of an eagle, one had the face of an ox had the face of a lion. Understand, when you read Ezekiel's description, Ezekiel says wherever God's throne goes, wherever God goes, these four living creatures follow him. And it says when they turn, they don't turn around. They always face in the same direction. So when they move, they move in the same plane. They don't turn to go somewhere. They move in the same direction, Ezekiel says. You get the picture? They don't turn. So when John sees them in heaven, he's looking maybe across the room towards these four living creatures. He sees them standing there. What would he see? He would see only the faces that are facing him. He's not going to see that they're not turning this way for him to see that they have three other faces. He's seeing each one with a particular face. Where Ezekiel, in his description, sees them in their fullest, and he sees that they have four faces. Now, what are the four faces uh, representing for us? How can we understand that? Well, the number four in the scriptures, you can go in, that book is in my office if you want to look at it again. The number four in the scriptures signifies creation or the world, creation or the world. So whenever we see four, we're thinking about God's creation, the whole world as a total being involved in whatever that is. If you think of uh, the four horses, we're going to read in just a second. If, I hope we can move along here. And in, in the next chapters, we're going to read about the four horsemen. The, the seals on the scroll begin to be opened up. And as each of the first four seals are opened by Jesus, by the Lamb, uh, one of the four living creatures says, come, and the horse comes forth. The four, what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Those four horsemen represent for us the whole span of the tribulation on the whole earth. The number four is important here. So we see four horsemen representing the seven-year time period that affects the whole earth and all of God's creation. One of the interesting things here is, is um, the number five that comes just after, after four. Can you think of a fifth horseman in the book of Revelation? I know there's not one. We always say the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and that's true. But there is a fifth horseman. Good. Chapter 19. There is another one that comes riding a white horse in, a, in an entirely different way. The first horse is the Antichrist. The fifth horse is the Lord Jesus. 
the number five, this is cool, the number five in the scriptures stands for grace. Grace. So we have the four horsemen that are affecting the whole creation and the whole world in total. And yet a fifth comes that represents grace for us all and completes the picture. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm? Four signifies creation or the whole world. So whenever you see the number four, ask yourself that. How is this, how is this speaking about the whole world? So let's go back to, this, uh, to these four living creatures. You've got a couple of different scriptures. One is smaller uh, on this sheet with the timeline. Let's go to the bigger one for a moment. This is really neat. Again, we see in the Old Testament the reflection of the new. We see what God is doing here in the Old Testament as he gives us a picture of what's coming in the New Testament. Uh, we read about the four living creatures. When you look at the encampment of Israel, that is described by God. He's the one that put this plan together. He told Moses, hey, guys, you've got the tent of meeting. Whenever you stop in the desert, this is how I want you to set it up. Every time you stop and you encamp, and I'll show you, you know, I'll lead you by a fire by night and a cloud by day. When that cloud stops, you're to encamp. And this is how you're to, how to, to set up the camp uh, of Israel. And notice at the center is the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God met with Moses and with the high priests. That's where the cherubim, by the way, remember the four living creatures around the throne? They are represented on the Ark of the Covenant by the two, two golden cherubim whose wings overspread the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat of God the throne of God, the presence of God. So we have in the center of the tabernacle, that's where the Levites were to work and to minister. The tribe of Levi was in the middle. But around the outside, there was three diff or four different encampments. The, the largest one was the encampment of Judah. It was three tribes, not just Judah, but it was the tribe of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. And the number of those in the tribe are given in the Old Testament, and it ends up being the largest of the four groups. It's 186,400. And it says that when you encamp, make sure that the standard of the head tribe, in this case Judah, make sure that that standard is set up in front of your encampment between the encampment and the tabernacle. Guess what the symbol for the tribe of Judah was a lion. Okay, let's, let's move around the encampment to the north. By the way, Judah faced to the east. Is there any significance there? By the, the, the front door, by the way, of the temple in Jerusalem faced to the east toward the Mount of Olives. That's where the garden was. The Mount of Olives was... Uh, when Jesus comes back, how's he coming back to Jerusalem? Hmm? Yeah, but where did he leave from? Mount of Olives. What did the angel say? When he comes back, he's going to come back in the same way. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. First of all, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and that mount is going to be split in half. He's going to return from the east. Judah the tribe of Judah, and the, the entrance of the temple faces the Mount of Olives, awaiting Jesus' return. And the sun rises. Thank you, Diane. The sun rises in the east. That's probably, that's probably just a coincidence. <laughs> okay, moving to the north around the circle, that second tribe or group of tribes was the tribe represented by the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan was Naphtali and Asher. 
total of 157,600 uh, Jews. And interestingly, interestingly enough, the symbol for Dan on that standard was the eagle. Moving to the west, the opposite from Judah is the tribe of Ephraim. That's represented by the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, 108,100 individuals. The symbol for Ephraim is a cat or the ox. And moving to the south is the tribe of Reuben. Within that encampment is the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. 151,450 individuals. If you look at that as it would have appeared from God's perspective, that encampment would have looked like a cross. In its dimensions, the number of people within that camp, it would have looked like a cross. And surrounding the mercy seat of God, the tabernacle, were the four names of the four groups uh, of tribes that were encamped around that place. The same names that are given to the four living creatures. Uh, in Ephraim, you've got that on the smaller, on your smaller diagram. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. This sheet, this sheet, sheet here with a timeline, okay. you can find a smaller, we just gave you a bigger picture of that. The smaller picture is, uh, is on the top of that sheet. By the way, as we look at that, and you would understand that in order to approach the tabernacle in the encampment of Israel, you had to, would have had to have passed by these standards to, to go to the center of the encampment. And to, to get to the throne of God, as described here by John, you would have gone past the four living creatures to approach the throne of God. Um, and in order to get... To God, in terms of salvation, you would have had to have passed the representative or the representation, rather, of Jesus. Jesus is the Lion of Judah. Jesus is represented by the ox as a suffering servant. Jesus is represented by the picture of the man. By the way, that's Ruth. Jesus is the son of man. And the eagle, Jesus is the king of heaven represented here. So we see the Lord even in these four faces of the creatures, God's creation. Four being creation, but we see Jesus as the beginning and the end, and he is involved with all of his creation. We could also, if, if we're talking here about um, creation itself, and we remember that in Ezekiel 10, the, uh, the ox is replaced or described instead as a cherub. What's a cherub? An angel. We're looking at four cherubim here. A single cherubim is a cherub, not a little baby with wings. Okay? A cherub is a mighty angel, one of the most powerful, if you will, uh, the living creatures. And these four faces, the man, the lion, the eagle, and the cherub, or the ox, could also represent the four types of God's free will creation. In other words, those create creatures that have free will. Man, certainly. Cherub representing the angels. Um, the lion representing the creatures of the earth having free will. And the eagle representing uh, the creatures of the air having free will. The lion being the king of beasts, the eagle in essence being the king of, of birds and of flying things. Uh, and so we could see represented in the four living creatures these four things uh, that God created in that way. Okay, questions? Each creature has four faces. Had the four, four of each face, right? Right. Okay. One of each face, so four they're, on each. There are four identical. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But they're facing in different ways. So they appear differently to John. Exactly. But Ezekiel clarified that in his. Yeah, exactly. He saw all four sides, all four <laughs> faces, where John just saw the throne with the four creatures standing there, not turning, so he could only see one side. So he saw all four faces, but 
not the ones that weren't in his vision, in his, in his uh, ability to see. Okay, uh, I think we can move forward unless you have a question. Chapter 5. Okay, let me stop you there, Donna, for just a second. Did you notice the under the earth? Paradise and hell. Hades. Sheol. Some place under the earth. I don't think, no, I don't think that's the case any longer. No, I don't think that's the case any longer. Go ahead, Donna. Let's finish that up. Questions. Bob? Uh, the first person on the throne holding the scroll, that was God. The Father. We see here, did you notice we see the Trinity? The Father gives the scroll to the Son, the Lamb, who has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. We talked about that last week. What about the seven horns? Are those horns that will blow or horns? Nah, no. Uh, you will find, as we go through, you will find a number of descriptions where particular creatures, uh, one of them, the, the great dragon who is Satan, he's going to have some horns as well. Um, what is seven again? Completeness. Completeness or fullness. Horns always represent power and authority. Power and authority. So in other words, Jesus, the lamb that has these seven horns, is full of the full power and authority of God. And is connected, he has these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. There's an intimate connection. A minute ago, we were looking on the throne of God. We were seeing the, 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 the ruby and the jasper, the emerald that gives us the understanding that it's Jesus that's being represented there. Jesus is on the throne with 
God the Father at that particular moment. But now we see in the middle of all this, we see this lamb who was slain and yet is alive. And he is the one, the only one in all creation that's worthy to open the seals of this scroll. What's the, what's the scroll, do you think? Hmm? Uh, it could be the book of life, but I think it's more than that. I've heard it described that way. Okay. Similar to a mortgage. Anybody else? A debt. A debt? Okay. It's interesting. It talks about a scroll. And if you read about scrolls in books, we know it to be a scroll because it said it was written on both sides that it was sealed. But even during that time, there were books. And even during the time of John, they had already started sewing leather sheets together, making books. Uh, it says uh, scrolls, seals. Okay. So, uh, it says to prevent tampering and unwanted use, the scroll will also be sealed with clay and pressed with the owner's mark. John had a will, which was sometimes witnessed and sealed by seven witnesses, which put into effect only upon the death of the testator. Okay. Here. Okay. Okay. Good. That's a good description. Hmm. The deed. All right. A deed. Uh, to eternity, we could think. There's a hint. Uh, if you go to Revelation chapter 14, Revelation 14 and verse 6. Now, this is after the scroll is opened. This is later on in tribulation. Revelation 14 and 6. Somebody have that? Okay, so here is this angel flying, and he has this eternal gospel in his hand. And it's described for us what that represents. It's speaking of the last days, but it's the eternal gospel which began really at the beginning of creation. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a special document is all I can call it. We don't know for sure, but I have a note uh, in the side margin right next to that first uh, reference to this scroll sealed with seven, uh, a reference referring to the eternal gospel. It could very well be that. We don't know. Bottom line, we don't know exactly what that is, but we know that it's very important. And the only one that can open it is Jesus Christ slain from this foundation of the world. So it's in connection to him. Barb? When I said a deed, a deed takes you way back to the beginning. That's right. Yeah. Who's the owner? John. Exactly. It identifies the owner. And the eternal gospel or good news would do that, would identify the true owner of all creation. That's right. That's right. That's right. So it's all connected, isn't it? And it's, it's giving us, we may not know exactly what's written in there, but we've got an idea that it's, it's, it's a connection uh, to what the Lamb has done in shedding his blood and the gospel that is eternal 
and will never, you know, the, the Bible says that the word of God will never pass away. The same scripture that we're reading tonight, uh, a million years from now, we will still have. The word of God doesn't pass away. And, and that eternal gospel is what we're reading tonight uh, as we go through uh, Revelation and all of the books of the scriptures. It's the word of God, the eternal gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Savior of the world. Okay, um, one of the things I wanted to point out to you here is this, uh, this song that is being sung, uh, and specifically I want to point out to you verse 10. Uh, this song is talking about you and I. Uh, it says, you are worthy, it's talking about Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God. That's us, folks. You purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then verse 10, you have what? You have made them to be a kingdom. Folks, we are the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom of God is within us. It's not a physical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom right now. It will be a physical kingdom when Jesus returns. But right now, the kingdom of God is within our hearts, is within us, and God has made us to be that kingdom. And, not just a kingdom, but priests. You are a priest tonight of the living God. What does that mean? What does a priest do? What's a priest supposed to do? I'm not talking about a pastor. Hmm? Lead and minister where? Everywhere, but... What, D? On earth. On earth. The earthly priest is the representative of God between God and man. So if we are priests of the living God, and we are, we are his ambassadors or his representatives here on earth to bring men to God, to minister as if the temple was here, and doing all of the service of God in our lives to testify and to lead others that don't know God to lead others to God. That's what a priest does. A priest is God's representative on earth to lead others to the knowledge of God and to for forgiveness. Okay, so we are a, a, a kingdom, a holy nation, by the way, connected to Israel and priests to serve our God. And they, us, will reign on the earth. What does that mean? Going to reign on the earth? The millennium. Yeah, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords here on earth, throne in Jerusalem, ruling over the whole earth. This is after the end of the tribulation. He will be the ruler of all the world. And you and I... The church will reign with him. Now, I can't tell you what position you're going to have. You're determining that right now. The position and the responsibility and the authority you will have then, you are determining right now by how you serve and obey God. Some of you might be a dog catcher. Some of you might be the mayor of New York. I don't know. But you will have a position of authority under King Jesus and you will be immortal you will know as he knows in full you're not going to have to get on the phone and call Jesus up and say I don't know what to do about this you'll know you'll be in direct communication with Jesus all the time and you will rule and reign with him in the fullness of that information and of his holiness and glory it's going to be a wonderful government a world government led by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with his church ruling and reigning with him. It's going to be a wonderful situation for a thousand years, but yet not perfect. And we're going to find out about that a little bit later on. Okay, any other questions about chapter 5? Yep, Diane. strange, doesn't it? Yeah. 
seems a little strange. Well, you mean people in hell are going to worship God? Scripture says every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This will be a song that will be sung by some who are in deep torment and remorse. As best they can. They will be singing. I don't know if you can call it worshiping. Faith? Okay. Okay, let's understand. If you read that sheet I gave you, all right, there's this place that the Jews call Sheol. In the New Testament, the word is Hades. Same place. And as it's described by the Jews, and as it's described in the New Testament by the church, the early church, it is really a place divided in two. One side is hell, place of torment for wicked souls. The other side is paradise, a place of bliss and blessing uh, occupied by uh, righteous souls. And that place was the dwelling place of all souls up until the cross. When Jesus came and died for sin, it changed it. Yeah, it changed it all. Steve, don't do it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, what happened at the cross? When Jesus died, remember what he said to the thief next to him? This day, tell you the truth. This day, not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week. This very day, you'll be with me in paradise. I didn't say you'll be with me in heaven. Remember what Jesus said to Mary? He met her at the tomb. He said, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. So he hadn't gone to heaven yet, but he'd gone to paradise. His intention when he died, he knew where he was going from the cross. He was going to go down into paradise. Why? Because there were righteous souls there. Yeah, Old Testament souls. Righteous souls before the law. What about Noah? Okay. I mean, the, the people that were there, the souls that were there, the righteous souls that were there, were there for one reason only. Faith. Faith was the, was the key. Yeah, I, and I get that. Okay. I so, that so Jesus goes to that place. Why? He has a purpose. He's going to preach the kingdom in that place. Now, we understand there's two different groups that are going to be listening. There's the group in hell. Remember the rich man? In Luke 16, he's talk, there's a conversation going back and forth between the rich man and Abraham. I thought that was heaven, too. No. It's, how can it be heaven? It's, it's below. It's not above. Hell's not up here. I guess I read it wrong. Okay. No, it says when the rich man died, he was buried, and he went to that place called hell or Hades, the place of torment, where Lazarus, but I'm talking about Lazarus, was in heaven. Lazarus went to paradise. paradise. <coughs> Abraham's bosom. It doesn't call that place heaven in Luke 16. That's called Abraham's side. In other words, if you're there, you're standing beside Abraham. He's there. It's a place of faith. Remember what God said to Abraham? Your your Obedience, your faith was accounted to you, Abraham, as righteousness. It's all about faith, folks. And if Abraham didn't know Jesus, hadn't come yet. He didn't know about the cross, hadn't happened yet. So those righteous souls that had died during all of creation up until the cross were waiting for the next step. To go to heaven, to be at the throne of God, 
But there was only one way that can happen. We're told in the book of Acts, there is so salvation in no other name. Jesus is the only name by which we can be saved, by which we can go to heaven. So those souls that were there, they were righteous souls because of their faith, but they needed to hear one other thing. They needed to meet Jesus, and he was going to lead them out. They were kind of like captives in that place waiting, but he had to lead them out of that place in his train, it says. It's almost like a, a bride going down the aisle with that long train behind he led them out of that place in his train. Where did he take them? He took them to heaven to be with God the Father. He emptied paradise at the cross, at the cross or at the resurrection. He emptied that place. Read that sheet. Hades, Hades is not destroyed until the great white eternal judgment. It says hell... But he didn't, he didn't destroy the place. It's still there. The people that have great faith but have never heard the word what of What about modern-day Jews? Where do they go? Do they go to hell? No. They have faith in the one creator God, the God of Israel. Would God condemn them to hell? No. That's right. That's right. So That's why Jesus. They're not going to heaven. They're going to paradise. For now. For now. And we don't know. We're not told. All right. We're not told what else is going on there. But we know that place still exists because it's a twofold dwelling place. It's hell and paradise. God hasn't destroyed it yet. He's not going to destroy it until the end of the book when hell and Hades are thrown in the lake of fire. So it only makes, we don't know all the information, but doesn't it make sense that if that place still exists and there are people out there that believe in the one creator God but don't know the name of Jesus or don't understand the gospel, there's never been a missionary come to their town, but they love God and they believe in God, doesn't it only make sense that God would provide a way for them to gain heaven? And that's the way. If they go to paradise now, what's to say that Jesus doesn't go there or won't go there again to bring them out just like he did the Old Testament saints? So we can't, we, we don't know all of that information. But it's an important thing to realize because that answers one of the most important questions of our, of our faith. What happens to those folks that love God and believe in God, but they've never heard the gospel message? God provides for them, I think, in this way. That's the universalist message. Well, that's kind of what it sounds like. Sometimes. No, no. The unrighteous dead still go to hell. They're going to be judged for their sins. But there are the righteous dead. Righteousness comes by faith that still are provided for by God's grace. Well, do they have God in the Jews? Sure. Don't the, don't the modern Jews? Don't they have, right now, they, they have a, a, a means. They don't have a temple anymore, but they have a means of seeking after God, and that's what it's all about. You know, how did Noah know? How did Abraham know? How did any of the Old Testament saints know about God? Because it says in Romans that we as individuals can understand who God is and what his plan is through what he has created. And so we know the truth. We can sense that within our hearts. And so we're, we're drawn to God in that way. One of the answers, take this sheet and, and read it through and study it a little bit. Take a look at the references. One of the interesting things that dawned on me, uh, I was thinking about paradise as always being referred to as down. Whenever you read about it, it's down. They went down uh, to, to uh, Sheol. Is the end paradise always used as under in the Bible? It is, except for... In 2 there's two, Yeah, there's two references. Yes. Paul <laughs> talks about being caught up to heaven, the third heaven, right. God's paradise. paradise. And then again, we read it in, in the early scripture in Revelation, where he says, talks about the paradise of God being up 
took him up to paradise. How do we figure that one out? Well, understand, the first paradise, you know, if there are two bad places, there's hell and there's a lake of fire, then is, isn't it possible that there's two places of blessing? Certainly there are. The second paradise that we read about in Corinthians and Revelation is not at Abraham's side any longer. It's at Jesus' side. It's where Jesus is. He is now the Savior of the world. Abraham was the father of the Jews, the father of the promise. Okay, read, read Luke 16 when you get a chance. Take a look at Luke chapter 16. This is Jesus talking. He's our best witness. He's been there. He knows about that place. Read the description of the rich man and Lazarus. This place called Abraham's side and this place called hell are in close proximity. What divides them is a chasm that can't be uh, penetrated, impassable chasm between the two so they can't cross over but they're within close proximity because they're talking back and forth to one another. It's not like paradise is up there and hell's down here. I understand that. Okay. Because we know as Christians, we don't go to par well, we don't go to paradise in the, the Old Testament sense, like Lazarus. The scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we go directly to heaven. We go up. Study that. Study the scripture there, Faith, and bring some questions back next week for us. Would you? See if you can't figure it out. <laughs> okay, let's let's finish up chapter six now. On your on your sheet that looks like this, you'll see down on the bottom the last day's timeline. You see just underneath Daniel's seventieth seven. That's the the seven year tribulation. You will see just underneath that where it says the seven seals run to the day of the Lord. The seven seals that we'll read about here in chapter 6 begin at the signing of the seven-year peace treaty. Keep that in mind. The first seal that's broken, the first horse that rides out is this white horse that sounds like peace that sounds good you think oh white horse that's a lone ranger no this is the antichrist that's being talked about here remember the first three and a half years are years of false peace and safety it looks like everything is good it looks like this guy on the white horse is a great peacemaker people will call him the messiah of the world the savior but he's just the opposite he's a deceiver so let's read chapter 6. Where do we leave off? a red horse its rider was given power to take away peace from the earth he was given power to make people kill each other and he was given a big sword the lamb opened the third seal then i heard the third living thing say come i, I looked and there before me was a black horse its rider held a pair of sickles in his hand 
Then I heard something that sounded like a voice. It came from where the four living things were. The voice said, the corn of wheat for a day's pay, and the three quarts of barley for a day's pay. And do not damage the owl, olive oil and wine. The lamb opened the fourth seal. Then I heard the voice of the four living things say, come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. Hades was followed close behind it. They were given power over the fourth of the earth. They were given power to kill people by the war, by starving them, by disease, and by the wild animals of the earth. Okay, so we see that the seven seals begin the signing of the peace treaty as the white horse rides forth to conquer and then continues on to the final day of the Lord. So it spans the seven seals, span the seven years. Now, not necessarily divided in an equal portion, so don't mistake that could very well be that the white horse rider is the first three and a half years representing uh, false peace and safety and then these other things fall into that last three and a half years by the way that last three and a half years is called the great tribulation you'll see that on your sheet that is the time the last three and a half years is where the wrath of God <coughs> is literally poured out in judgment upon the earth uh, and so we'll, we'll see there are, by the way, three sets of seven judgments in the book of Revelation. We've read about one tonight, the seven seals. There will be seven trumpets and there will be seven bowls or vials poured out. And you can see on your timeline the approximate timing of each of those three judgments made up in groups of seven. You'll notice on that sheet, we don't have listed the rapture. We're going to talk about that. Because I know uh, probably the majority of the church is at least hoping for a pre-trib rapture. But there is strong evidence that the rapture will be in the middle of the seven years. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. Uh, you all know that I started off in my early years as a Christian as a pre-trib rapturist, if you will, believing in the pre-trib. I am now mid-tribulation in my theology. I believe that the church has got to be tested if the wheat and the tares representing true Christians and 
imitation Christians, if those in the church are going to be separated, there has to be a time of separating or persecution of trouble. Uh, and I think that's the first three and a half years. And I'll give you some other reasons. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 is a great chronology given by Jesus of how this is going to unfold uh, and how things fall in line. And in that account, Jesus talks about the abomination of desolations in the temple three and a half years in. And then he describes what represents for us as the rapture, the blowing of the trumpet and the cat catching up of the saints of God to meet him in the clouds. Uh, so you be, the, you be the judge of that. Either way, we're going. Uh, sooner or later, we're going, and it's not going to be long. Uh, so that is, uh, that is what we're taught. Questions on Chapter 6? We have uh, just a short time left here. Anything on Chapter 6 that we'd like to talk about tonight or anything else that, that we've read tonight or something else that's on your mind? It extends through the Great Tribulation. The seven seals extend through the seven years of tribulation. Okay, and do the seven uh, bowls and the seven horns go through the entire seven The seven years? trumpets, if you look on your last day timeline, the seven trumpets run to the day of the Lord. They are within the last three and a half years, God's wrath. And the worst part, the, the, the very worst part of God's wrath is at the very end of that three and a half years, that is the seven bowls, the judgment of the seven bowls that are poured out in the very last days of that th last three and a half years, and it will be, uh, will be terrible. You know, it says about a quarter of the earth's inhabitants at that time. By the way, we'll be gone. We'll be in heaven in glory. But it says about a quarter of the earth's inhabitants will die uh, figuring at that point in time there's going to be, if, if, if things continue the way we are, there's going to be about 8 billion people on earth. So that means 2 billion will die during this seven-year period. It's going to be horrendous. It's going to be terrible. Uh, but we will, we will be taking, taken out in time so as not to have to endure the wrath of God. So you think Don't know exactly the timing. Oh, I see. Well, okay. What does the red horse represent, Bob? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, wars. Okay. Uh, wars and rumors of war. There's going to be wars going on. It's going to be. It's going to look like the Antichrist is this great peacemaker. He's going to be always on the side of peace. But behind the scenes, notice he's carrying a bow. That rider is carrying a bow. Doesn't say he's carrying a sword. He's carrying a bow. The interesting thing about a bow is it injures in a di at a distance. You can shoot a bow across the distance and, and hit and kill somebody or injure somebody, and they don't even know where it came from. It's not like standing next to somebody with a sword. They, they're face to face with you. They can see you. That's, that's, yeah, that's later. Hmm? It could. What's going to be going on, folks, in that three and a half years of false peace is they're going, there's still going to be wars that are breaking out. And it's going to look like this rider of the white horse, the, the Antichrist, is going to be look, he's going to look like the good guy. He's going to always be there trying to make peace. But behind the scenes, he's going to be stirring things up, working to his own advantage. Remember, his goal is to be ruler of all the world. And he will attain that three and a half years in when he stands in the temple and declares himself to be God. Well, then the whole world will fall in behind him. But up to that point, he's building his power and his kingdom until that three and a half years is complete. So he's going to be carrying this bow. Will we as Christians be revealed before he can die? Hmm?
three and a half years in. Yeah. Who, by the way, who are all of these? In, in verse 9, when he opened the fifth scroll, I saw under the altar, this is in heaven, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. Who's that? That was during the first three, or no, that was like during the last part. Good. Good. Later on, which seal is it? That part I know. Okay. So who, who is that? Is that you? Is that the church? No, tribulation. Tribulation saints. Good. Yeah, they are there waiting. They've been slain because of the word of God by the Antichrist, by his associates. There's going to be a lot of martyrs during the tribulation. They are waiting under the throne. They're given white robes. That speech speaks of righteousness. They're given. And that is in verse 9. This is telling us to wait. I'm coming to get you a little longer to wait, right? Yeah. Those are the ones who did not go to the rapture with us Christians. No. That's right. But they will join us. They're waiting. The tribulation saints. Because when everything happened to us, um, these people went, oh my, they're going in for us. Yeah. Oh my. They're like, I don't know. Do they know? They don't know. No, these are the ones that come to faith, that come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior during the real During the tribulation period. Now, if we're, if we're raptured beforehand, they will say, uh-oh, it was true, and they're going to they're gonna finally believe, but it's do too... Do believe we're going to? Do I believe we're going to what? Because I'm trying to figure out where you're coming in on this. Are you, you're after the first three and a half? As part of the rapture? Yeah, yeah I believe it's going to be three and a half, yeah. So are Mid-tribulation. Mid so it's three and a half in, like yeah. he says. So Diane? That's another important point. When the church is raptured, then he who hinders, we've described that already, the Holy Spirit is the one right now in the world that is hindering Satan's activity. Right. And the Holy Spirit is within every believer. So it's the Holy Spirit within the church that is hindering the activity of Satan. Now, when the church is taken up, that presence of the Holy Spirit... now. Holy Spirit is God, so he's omnipresent. He's always everywhere. But the important point is he's in the hearts of the church. We are the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom is within us, represented also by the power and leadership of the Holy Spirit. So when we are taken up, the one who hinders is taken up with us, and that gives the Antichrist full authority and power to do what he wants to do and Satan to do what he wants to do. So if it's if that how these tribulation saints are willing to die as martyrs. Because they me. because they know the truth. Because they saw us go. Yeah. And don't I forget there's a couple other groups that are going to be active during that time. There's 144,000 select Jews that God has chosen to be his his witness during the seven-year tribulation. And there are the two witnesses during the last three and a half years that stand in Jerusalem. Many say it's Moses and Elijah that will be witnessing for God and doing miracles before the whole world. And you know, you know what Revelation says about them. So if the church is taken up pre-trib and the Holy Spirit with the church then that would mean that the Antichrist and Satan would have full sway in that first three and a half years. And that's not what we read. It's not until the last three and a half years where the fullness of the Antichrist's power and Satan's presence comes into play during the, the, the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. So we'll talk some, we've run out of time, we'll talk some more about that. Good stuff to chew on though, to think about. Uh, and, and you know, it doesn't really matter 
I don't think it really matters whether we pre we're pre-trip or mid-trip because we're going regardless. Yeah. We're going to be home and we're going to be with the Lord forevermore. And that's the confidence we have. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Make a point of, isn't it amazing? We are in the last days, and there are so many movies, Hollywood productions coming out that point us toward God. You've got Noah, you've got Son of God, you've got Heavens for Real, and the list goes on and on and on. And don't forget that God is not dead. Jesus is not dead. Right. There's another one. So take advantage of that. All of these have good things to offer, not necessarily good. They serve a good purpose as they bring God to the attention of the world. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer, guys, and we will close. Father, thank you for this time tonight. You have been gracious. You have been a good teacher, Holy Spirit. Uh, and, Lord, we know that we're like children. It's like meeting uh, in our kindergarten class uh, tonight. Lord, you know so much more than we do. You have so much more information to show us and tell us by your Holy Spirit. But in the meantime, we will say thank you for you have helped us to take yet another step toward maturity and understanding. And that we know that's what you want us to do, is to grow in our faith and to gain understanding. Lord, for those things that aren't clear, uh, when we wake up and it looks like a, a foggy mirror in the bathroom in the morning and we just can't see clearly, Lord, clear those things up for us. Uh, in, in times to come, at the right time and in the right way. Show us the truth, uh, and we will obey, uh, and we will uh, walk according to that truth as you reveal it to us. Lord, thank you for that process in us, and thank you for your word, Lord, that gives us enough information to know uh, what lies ahead and for what you have done for us uh, throughout the centuries. Thank you, Lord, for this group tonight. Bless your church. Uh, bless us as we travel back to our homes. Keep us safe, Lord God. And just be with us in a, in a powerful, in a real way throughout this week as we bear testimony to your love and goodness in our life. And we'll thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for your time tonight, thank folks. You.